Well, hello there and a lovely big warm welcome to our webinar. My name is Sharon Mark Teggart. I am the co-founder and, uh, and director of Curious Piano Teachers. And uh, in just a moment, I'm gonna be getting online my other uh, co-founder, Dr. Sally Cathcart. Um, but today we are presenting um, uh, are hosting a webinar with Trinity College London. We have the Chief Examiner um, of Music at Trinity College, uh, Peter Wilde, um, just about to come on the call. So if you bear with me, I am going to get the necessary people um, onto the call. And in the meantime, um, I'd love you to type into the chat box and let us know whereabouts you are listening in from this morning. Um, indeed, depending on exactly where you are in the world, it may not be the morning. Uh, so just bear with me one second and I should now have Peter on the call. I've got Anna on the call. Hello. Hello there. Hello. We're just finishing our final bits of setup where Peter's just on his way. That's perfect. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to welcome everyone. Um, I'm just going to open up my chat and I'm going to get everyone um, welcomed onto the call. I also need to see if I can get Sally onto the call. Um, so Sally, if you are there um, and logged in, just put up your hand and I will get you onto the call. Meanwhile, we have, I'm just going to shout out for, for everyone who's, who's commenting. Um, Caitlin is listening in from Liverpool. Hey there, good morning, Caitlin. We have Jilly, who says hello from Leeds. And I know we have people joining us all the time. I was kind of popping in really nice and early there this morning. Um, I don't think I've got Sally on the call just yet, at least I don't think I can see her. Um, <clears throat> So again, if you are, yes, hello, we have Jan from Kingston. Um, and the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna set so that whenever you guys comment, everyone else can see those comments. So I'm just gonna pop that in there. Okay, and I'm pretty sure that Sally is there now. So I'm just gonna go over and say hello to Sally. <clears throat> Sally, good morning, how are you? Good morning, Sharon. I'm very well, thank you very much. Lovely to be here and great that uh, everybody is piling in. I'm just catching up here, yes. I can see lots of people coming on board. And hello to Anna over there at Trinity. Hi, Anna. Um, and eight, 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 waiting in the wings somewhere will be Peter, <laughs> making his grand entrance. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yes, if you're just joining the call, please do hop into the comments. Um, please do say hello. Please let us know whereabouts you're listening from. Um, and if you watch this later as the replay, then uh, we just want to say hello to you as well. Uh, it is our great pleasure to uh, introduce to you this morning uh, Peter Wilde, who is the, uh, the Associate Chief Examiner at Trinity College London. And uh, Peter and I go back a very, very long way. And um, I've got a little story for you. Peter's going to get worried now. <laughs> oh, my but my first encounter uh, <clears throat> with Peter was, it's going to be kind of well over 20 years ago. And when I walked into an exam room, and of course, Peter was sitting there at the other side. So yes, Peter was my, I think it was grade five, um, Peter. Um, I don't think either of us can remember probably anything much uh, about the encounter, but uh, we have, as um, I then got into the world of, of music teaching and piano teaching, uh, Peter and I got to know each other uh, really quite well. So just to give you a little bit of background, Peter was um, born in Sydney, Australia. Uh, his parents then moved back to England and he studied at, at Cheatham's in Manchester and later at the Royal Academy of Music in London. <clears throat> so we're really excited to have him on this call today where he's going to be basically giving us a whistle stop tour um, of initial third to grade five. 
as you can uh, appreciate, there's a lot of stuff in there. So it really is going to be a very broad brush stroke. But Peter is just the person uh, to be giving you a fabulous, fabulous overview. And I know that we already have received um, quite a few questions to do with improvisation. So we have asked Peter to, to really dig into that and, uh, and to let you know more about that. Now, we were also hoping to have Julia Martin, who is Head of Product Development on the call. Unfortunately, she is not able to be with us. She is unwell this morning. Um, and I think she's actually possibly lost her voice as well. So there was no way that she was going to be able to, to speak to us. But um, Peter's going to be filling you in a little bit um, as we go along. And the other thing is that when we send out the replay, we're going to be sending you a, a handout from Trinity with um, various links and, and things that are referred to on, on today's call. So what I would love to invite you to do is throughout the call, if you have any questions, Sally and I will be monitoring those questions. So please do type them into the chat. We will pick those up. And at an appropriate point throughout the, the presentation, we will be giving those questions to Peter. So this is your chance to ask the Chief Examiner um, of Music uh, at Trinity College London pretty much anything. Okay, there's probably restrictions in that. We'll not, we'll not say <laughs> anything, Peter. <laughs> anything to do with about the, exams. Um, about the exams. Sally, any other thoughts just before we get going? No, I'm just trying to uh, get people to, to share. I can see there's quite a few people on the call. And we'd love to know where you're, where you're listening from and where you're based. Um, so I can see we've got Anne, we've got Caitlin, Catherine, Dawn, Denise. I think you're Reading, aren't you, Denise? Emma, yeah, just down the road as well. Flora. So do, you do need to put in for when you're typing in your chat, you need to do for all panellists and attendees, please. Yeah? So just make sure that that's there and then everybody able to see. So Susan's ah, got got the ball rolling well done susan so she's from tameside whereabouts is that susan i'm thinking it might be um scotland but i could be wrong on that one um anybody else like to just let us know where it is that you're calling from greater manchester of course i knew that really um Lovely we have else? Anne, who is listening in from norfolk yeah we have Joe from Wakefield. Lovely. So just keep those, keep yeah. those coming. Um, we have Joe from Wiltshire near Bath. I'm Lovely. guessing we're going to have most people today, probably UK based, um, as opposed to anybody from America. But it'd be interesting to know if there's anybody out there who is, who is in America, although you'd have to be up very early, wouldn't you? Um, but it would be, yeah, it would be good to know if you're here, Jan from Kingston. Okay, I think that's Kingston, UK, rather than Kingston, Ontario, probably. But um, uh, yeah. And I wonder um, if anybody's got any snow. <laughs> we have also Flora, um, who is uh, listening in from north of Bista. Oxford. Today. Bista. Yeah. And Jenny in Birmingham. Lovely. So. Without further ado, Peter, you know it is absolutely our pleasure to have you on this call. We're really excited about this. So we're going to hand over to you and um, let you get dug into that lovely repertoire that you're going to be sharing with us. Over to you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sally. And thank you for the opportunity to share some of this repertoire with you. Um, it is going to be a whistle-stop tour. So I'm covering from initial to grade five. Uh, we've got a wonderful, varied, wide selection covering depth and breadth of all musical styles. And hopefully at each level, there'll be something for each age group. You know, we think of initial examination, uh, perhaps for the, the younger people, but there are older ones, more mature people, who are interested in taking our lower level examinations. And so some of the pieces perhaps are aimed at the more mature player. So opening up Trinity exams, exams for the whole of the world as it were for every type of person every individual who might like to take so we're going to have a look first of all at a piece from the initial uh, level exam um, a lot of the the pieces are let's say exploring 
um, corners and nooks of the repertoire which are perhaps not so well known. So a lot of pieces you'll find through the repertoire which uh, would be new to you and I think that's lovely stars for you to explore, new names to discover and perhaps then go on and investigate other pieces by those particular composers. And initial level, well, I've gone for a piece which will immediately um, perhaps appeal to the younger player. It's a piece called The Waltz of the Toads. And what an, uh, 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 an amazing juxtaposition of concepts, a waltz and toad. So straight away, you have the imagination of the little one, hopefully running riot, I'm going to say. And that's the teacher's part as well. It's a, it's a very much a partnership, teacher and student, and it's coming together and inspiring those ideas and creating something, a spark in the imagination, which is going to come through in the performance. I'm going to play it for you. Suitably elegant toad. Well, yes, and, and yet it's lovely the way the absurdity of, of the situation, the waltz uh, concept of the toad, is just beautifully, uh, if you like, melded to create this wonderful piece. And as I was playing it, there were things that were going through my mind. I mean, what a wonderful uh, opportunity to practice staccato. It's going at a very steady waltz speed, a nice sort of staccato is appropriate there to give out that bite that you need and then you have the scrunchy I'll call them scrunchy minor seconds the dissonances uh, which are in the right hand and of course they just add that little bit of if you like ridiculousness absurdity to the situation and there and there are two ways of approaching that you could indulge in the absurdity of the piece by really playing those out, Mr. Toad, in the big manner. Or it could be a subtle one. It could be a pompous opening and then maybe more delicately plays. So straight away, and I'm doing what I'm not supposed to be doing, and that's talking and playing at the same time. But you see what I mean? It's, it's a question of immediately we're thinking of trying to get the best out of the character of the piece. The other thing that really occurred to me when I was playing this piece relates to um, improvisation. It's wonderful how we can connect elements of music uh, so aptly. And people need ideas to be able to relate to a stimulus, a stimulus that you might get in a Trinity examination. Did you notice how the opening figure later in the piece is actually inverted? So you're getting that to create a different sound, a different feeling altogether. And that's one of the, the, let's say, tools that can be used as an improvisation building block. You have an idea, you think, well, what do I do with that idea? So why not invert it or play it higher or change the key or something? But that's a sort of basic thing that seems to sort of uh, come from this piece. And then you see how the composer, having done with his inversions, and then the whole of the last part develops the the scrunchiness of the minor seconds. And there is a shift in hand position at the end, but look how the music gives the student time to do that and to enjoy the performance, to enjoy the ritinuto and to really play out. What a wonderful way it is for the, the student to demonstrate his confidence by just playing out the C major chords. As I play the last chord, I feel the weight of my body going into that full tone. Okay, shall I move on to grade one? Or do you have any comments about the waltz of the toads? Well, I, I was just going to make one little comment, and that was that would be a wonderful opportunity in the early learning stages for the teacher to do a duet with the pupil. So the pupil can be can be focusing on the left hand melody, let's say, whilst the teacher puts in the accompaniment, and then they can swap over. And I think that's something that teachers can can really incorporate a lot more in their in their teaching. 
absolutely. It's it's wonderful when we we have let's say, repertoire for an examination level. And that becomes a wonderful resource for doing so many things. That's an excellent idea, Sally. And, uh, and of course, that's how, if you like, we can think of breaking down the building levels of the piece in terms mm. of learning it. Mm. But of course, sight reading comes into learning a piece for the first time. We have to choose the right tempo. And we also want to develop a sense of fluency in the playing. And this is where actually sharing it between yeah, teacher yeah, and student yeah. makes all the difference because yeah. it is the teacher that's going to propel that, the student mm. won't have. Mm. Abs absolutely. And it's that sense of being together and collaboration. And I always come back to this word collaboration because we know as pianists what a lonely life it can be. And the more we can do things with other people within our sphere, yeah. you know, Absolutely. Yeah. The experiences overall. But, you know, just going back to using the material that we have, um, I think it's great to be able to use snatches of the pieces we use in the repertoire for developing oral skills as well. So you play something for somebody, it could perhaps be a, a piece in the book that you're not uh, studying with, with the student and you could just play a snatch and say can you tell me what the time signature is here or can you listen to the dynamics and it really is opening up the music in an oral way before they start to, to learn the piece and actually they can discover a lot more about it when they're not playing because we all know as teachers that the moment you give someone something to learn they start looking at the note the right notes and of course the right notes are important but sometimes they become the things that are only important to some of the performers. If we can open up the piece, the style, the, uh, let's say, the whole value of the piece is a, a piece of music, then uh, we do that before we start looking at the nitty gritty. It can be a wonderful introduction to that. Mm. Great. So yeah. shall we move on to grade one? Yes. So if I look at, keep looking at my watch, I'm not being rude. I'm just so bad at timekeeping. Um, in grade one, I'm going to choose a piece um, by a composer that is quite well known, I think, in educational circles. This is a piece called I'm Happy, and it's by Joyce Grill, who's actually published quite a lot of music and maybe a familiar name. This is, again, a charming piece. Uh, I like it particularly because it's one of those pieces where you have the title, I'm happy, and you'll see how delightfully that fits into the motive that she's chosen to construct the piece from. So you'll, be, you'll hear, I'm happy, coming through as I play the piece. Let's have a listen to this one. So again, absolutely charming. And I've chosen it because, as I say, you can use the words to bring the uh, motive to life. But it's also a springboard, I think, for uh, another teaching technique, and that is putting words to quite a few things that people say, particularly if there are problems with rhythm. It's lovely to verbalize it. There's nothing actually rhythmically difficult in that piece, but it's so lovely just to think of, I'm happy. And sometimes, if you have the stress of a word, it's much more easy to demonstrate a point of stress and accentuation and then release by using that word. Happy is very much something which has a stress on the first syllable. And so it's much easier then to relate that to the which is just like a, a two note slur. And then of course you put the I'm on, which is always as an anacrusis, and it gives you the sense of and already something which is quite mundane in shape, takes on a musical characteristic. It starts to become musically interesting. And it's so lovely the way she develops that. And then a longer phrase. And so by the left hand. So music 
realistically speaking, it's doing all the things we're expecting. It's starting in a key and it's modulating to a key which we recognize. When we move on to the third line, it will move into the minor key. And again, that provides interest. When you're listening to this piece, it's one of those places where you, you're not quite sure what the journey is going to do for, where it's going to take you. And it's very, very musically interesting. And of course, from a technical point of view, it has lovely sort of um, examples of thumb under for right hand and left hand. And once more, we have a, a great variety of articulation. In a piece that's quite gentle at the start, it doesn't have to be very, very short staccato. We can just sort of, you know, just gently separate those notes so you get a nice background lilt almost but not that sort of staccato staccato is such a variable thing and we've got to think carefully about the sort of staccato that's appropriate for the mood of the piece anything yeah. uh, well two things struck me immediately the first of all i love this i'm happy and of course it's a so me so so for with my Kadai hat on so you know you can go around finding all your minor thirds everywhere in the piece which is fab and then i was just thinking you could get the pupil to create some words to complete the sentence can't you you know wouldn't that be lovely so, and when that's done it and really trinity is very much about personalizing music becoming a real part of mm. the experience and looking at something like that you're giving the student a chance to make that piece of music his or her own piece of music yeah, yeah. the way we start to think about individual interpretations things that little ones don't think about they think of a piece of music and uh, yes it's got a title but they won't always think about how they can make it their own piece and through words uh, which I, I said also earlier, I think it, it's a marvellous way of opening up their imagination. Mm. You probably have to give some examples, but then of course they can build on that. Uh, some children are quite reticent when they think, oh dear, what am I going to say? You know, but point them in the right direction. And sometimes words can be really silly. That's what I like. They don't always have, they don't always have to make sense. They can yeah. just be an interesting sound yeah. and it's something they've cottoned onto. And that really is personalising a piece of music uh, mm. from of you. Do you know, aren't we lucky to be piano teachers? Because when, you know, all we're doing is we're responding to an individual and we're thinking, what works here? How does this fit into their lives? How can we make this better? How can we spark their imagination? And it's through all these psychological, if you like, games and tools and building blocks that we use that we open up the world of music for our students. You know, that, that, that's that's lovely and i'm actually just typing into the comments because i love everyone who's listening to just you know why do you love being a piano teacher just type in one or two words into the comments we'll, we'll read some out in a minute peter over to you again excellent well i i think that might be a, a good point just to divert slightly from the pieces and have a look at the sort of technical work uh, that's required in a trinity examination um the, the technical work of piano examinations falls into two parts. First of all, there are scales um, or, and arpeggios or broken chords, depending on which level you're playing at, and you have exercises to play. Now, that might sound like quite a lot, but the, the actual keys um, in grades initial, initial to grade five, it's just two major and two minor keys per grade. So we have a small, if you like, requirement in terms of key knowledge, but then these are, are actually applied to different patterns. And the emphasis there, of course, is on listening. So we're learning technical patterns with our fingers, but also, if you like, learning to use our ears. It's important that when even playing a technical exercise, we're listening very, very carefully. So for instance, at grade two, we will be asking the candidates to be looking at playing scales, piano and forte. So straight away, the focus has to come away from just playing the right notes with hopefully the right fingering, but actually is the sound that you're producing something which can be recognizable as a particular dynamic level. And at grade four, we will be expecting uh, students to be thinking about making legato sounds and staccato sounds. So all of the blocks that we see in music are being demonstrated in the technical work. 
Now, the exercises uh, which I want to spend just a little time on, because it's something which really categorizes, um, uh, let's say, Trinity Utilities as being uh, another point of uniqueness, and that is we have three areas of technique which are focused on in the exercises. So there are six exercises per examination level, and each pair is devoted to a particular specific technical consideration. So the first pair would be uh, looking at tone, balance, and voicing. The second pair would be various types of coordination in piano playing. And the third pair would be looking more at finger and wrist strength and flexibility. So all, as I'm sure you'll agree, key areas uh, which a pianist have to develop. So the candidate chooses one from each of those categories. So they are building up um, a repertoire of three exercises for the examination. When the candidate goes into the examination, he chooses which one he would like to play first. And then the examiner will choose the second exercise. In the examination, only two of the exercises are actually but the idea that the, the candidate has the initial control and is, is able to make that choice is a lovely thing because it's about settling in. You know, they may have three exercises and perhaps one is stronger than the other. And so we allow them to choose that and be able to get underway with that particular exercise. Would you like to hear some exercises from grade one just to give you a flavor of those? So in the first category, which is tone, balance, and voicing, we have an exercise called Tundra. It's quite slow, uses some chords in the left hand, but is about shaping phrases and being able to control the tone through a phrase. And in the second group, which is coordination, we have pas de deux. So straight away, you can see the contrasting nature of those exercises. The first one is quite expressive and requires um, a lot of listening again to ensure that the tone matching is uh, musically balanced throughout the phrase line. Um, the second one is coordinating rhythms as well as hand patterns and articulation. And often there'll be some overlap. I mean, clearly, if you have a, a piece which is um, for tone, balance and voicing, it, it, it will inevitably include some coordination issues as well. And, and finger and wrist strength or whatever, there will be a slight overlap between them. Let's have a look at the last uh, group now, uh, which is finger and wrist strength and flexibility. So here, plenty of opportunity to exercise the thumb under movement in both hands and, uh, and maintaining that rhythmic sort of integrity which is necessary for a piece. It's actually called co going underground. Did you notice how I call that a piece? Because I can, um, I can sometimes not bear to bring myself to call them exercises because they are really miniature pieces of music which have so much musical content. And that's the whole point. These are not just technical hurdles to be surmounted. They are musical statements, they are musical expressions whereby the student can engage with a particular technical issue but in the context of a musical environment and I think that is so very very important. I've just noticed at the top of the second page is a, a piece which looks so delicate, it's called the Ming Vase. This is a coordination piece uh, but so different from the pas de deux. Now it's to do with coordination as we move from one hand to the other. So 
so delicate and fragile. But it's, it's, it's actually testing something quite different. It's are you able to match the hands? This relates also to the tone balance. We have a coordination example, but it must have well-balanced tone. We're dealing with a very, very exposed texture where single notes start to matter more than anything else because that's all we can hear. And it's giving the, the student the opportunity to listen to the way they can create those delicate lines. So that gives you a little sort of uh, overview of what to expect in the, the exercise mm. pattern. Mm. Lovely, and I, I love the way you're referring to them there as, as musical expressions, because it does actually, you can kind of easily shift into a different mindset, the mindset that you really need to be thinking of. You can't be thinking, Technically, rigidly, it, when you're doing these, it's 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 those little musical moments. Um, I think that's that's a really um, apt thing to remember. And I'm just going to read out a couple um, of these comments. So we've been asking, why do you love being a piano teacher? Um, Joe said, piano teaching is never all capitals, never boring. <laughs> We'd agree with that. Um, Jan says, seeing a person's general confidence growing. Absolutely, Jan. Flora says, because every student is different, raises different questions, challenges, and comes in with different ideas. Sometimes can be, that can be quite surprising. And I agree, um, Flora, sometimes uh, we, can, we can feed off our students as much as the other way around. Um, and Anne says, the pleasure from an adult's absolute joy at playing a piece of music that they never thought they could play. They were wonderful. Yeah. It really is one of the greatest pleasures I've had, I think, being a teacher. And you get up in the morning and think, oh, what are waiting for us today? And it's all a surprise, a joy, and it's made our lives totally worthwhile. That probably yeah. sounds very clear. But I mean, I just really yeah. feel quite passionately about it and the importance which we do in introducing, uh, you know, not just children, but a whole, I, I've had people come to me, they're retired from their job and they have done a little playing earlier in their lives and they want to go back and you're opening up new doors and it's so exciting. Mm. Mm. I, I'm just going to say to everybody that the sound sometimes of the piano um, is a little strange and I'm sure Peter is playing all the pieces at the right speed because from my end I can sometimes hear the first few bars go faster than the rest of it but I think it's just the sound catching up on itself okay so that wouldn't be very good coming from the, the lead senior examiner I can I can just about play in time I promise. yeah yeah absolutely it is it is the it is the streaming that is catching up I just wanted to point that out to everybody have you got that Sharon as well can you hear that <clears throat> A little bit, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So onwards with grade two. Well, from grade two, I've chosen um, a piece uh, called Persian Holiday. And this is by um, a young composer. And we've used his work before. A very imaginative composer, Sam Cleaver. Um, it's interesting because I think out of the 91 pieces that we have just in the grade books, this is aside from alternative pieces, from those 91, I think about 37 are from living composers, so we're really representing uh, that important group of people who are writing as professional musicians, but also as music educationists. They're writing specifically for piano teachers to have good material uh, to be able to use. So here we go. This is Allegro Energico. <coughs> cheeky piece you can hear and it has an, a lot of important ingredients first of all it's introducing um, a slightly unusual sound world we get a lot of sort of 
that's from the Phrygian mode, um, and sounds that perhaps the student is not expecting. They may even sound a little discordant at first, but it's creating a new colour, an exoticism in the music, perhaps which they're not used to. But from a technical point of view, there are a number of interesting things here. The left hand um, is often ostinato-like, and you'll just hear... providing, if you like, the substance on which the right hand can travel. But it's so particularly um, detailed in its articulation, so it's necessary that we can feel the slur, and we have nicely defined staccato on the quavers, and it's that that's going to give the character to the music. If I put it together again, you can hear the importance of the left hand stresses. So it's being able to develop the confidence in the left hand and then allowing it to take its role in the course of the piece so we're building up the picture. Of course, the lovely thing about this is because there are so many intricacies in the right hand, you're also trying to develop the hand independence. There'll be a number of occasions where one hand has to lift and the other hand will just be holding on. And we know actually that can be something that needs dealing with very, very carefully. So the piece you know, if you're not careful, it could be approached in a manner which is just looking at all the right notes and, and ignoring, if you like, the important aspects of articulation. But it is those aspects of articulation that I have to say will make the performance. Lovely. Thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> wait, I'd, put out this, <laughs> I'd put out this question, what's happening on this holiday? Um, Flora is saying, sounds like the snake charmer. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Is that, uh, I'm... Is that Sally? Who, who... <laughs> I bet <laughs> Sally has some good thoughts here. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, my thoughts were, what a wonderful uh, uh, way to get into improvisation as well. And it, it was just reminding me, we, we've got a, a webinar for our members later on today with a chap called Forrest Kinney, who's come up with some books called Pattern Play. And he's an American and has got some fantastic improvisation ideas in these books. And one of them is exactly this. It's sort of the magic carpet ride. And he does all sorts of wonderful, when, when, when he does it live, he, he, he pre-prepares the piano. So he puts uh, a piece of music under, over the bass strings and he puts some pens and things on the top strings. So you get, you play, you could try that with this piece. So it sounds completely different and utterly, utterly wonderful. Oh my gosh, we're all so imaginative. It, it, it's so heartening to hear this. Um, <laughs> I only have one comment about the piece and I wasn't sure I should mention it, but I hear <laughs> that um, somebody in this piece is a little bit tipsy. I'm not sure whether it's the panel or the rider, but yes. there's something, something a bit wonky in parts of it. <laughs> and I think it's those surprises that again make the piece such a charm. Even mm. that shift in the middle, you know, you've had a few dissonances. <laughs> You're not expecting it. Music yeah, that's right. Yeah. surprises. It's yeah. on a very basic level, but it's providing, the, and of course, then you can't get bored. You, you think, what do I do with that? How do I make yeah. it? And yeah. one of the dynamics, you've got a dynamic uh, range yeah. here, a P to, to fortissimo. Mm. And it's how to control those dynamics. I mean, I think possibly I started too loudly for my NF. So I struggled knowing that I had then a forte and a fortissimo to come. And it's those aspects which are about preparing your performance, how do you look at the piece as a whole, how do you use those dynamics in terms of a context so they work as an entity rather than, oh yes, that's MF, and then, you know, oh, I've got to get a bit louder, but have you left room to get louder? Mm. Have you left room to get quieter at the end? Mm. It's so easy in, in bar 21, the last line, to play much too quietly in the MP, and then where do you go after that? You, you, you have no diminuendo, you throw this all away. And it's considerations like that that are so important, I think, in characterising a piece of this nature. Mm, for sure. On we go. On we Lovely. go. Yep, yep. I'm going to uh, turn to, um, actually, I think one of my favourite pieces in, in the syllabus. So grade three, and we have um, a piece, a wonderful title, yet again, Sunrise on the Matterhorn, 
um, I expect a bit of, bit of explanation would be needed to uh, be given to some children regarding what the Matterhorn actually <laughs> is. But once the scene is set, then this piece is just a dream. I think it's a remarkable piece in that, considering that the, the means with which the composer uh, engages with it, they're really quite straightforward, and yet it, it, it's able to create this wonderful landscape of the sunrise over this magnificent mountain. And look at the things that are, are now being introduced. Pedal um, for the first time in the exams. Of course, that doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't be pedaling before grade three, but here you have a continuous piece with, um, uh, with pedaling, allowing the chords to, to be uh, connected, but also giving it a sort of grandeur. Without the pedal, this piece would be nothing. So you're a, a, a student is learning what the pedal can be in terms of the soul of the piece. It really helps to warm and, and give it a, a very, very, romantic air of expression and we have these wonderful you know children just love crossing over i mean what a glorious this sort of showy off movement this is when you can just take your hands and it gives you the time to do that there's no hurriedness here because the 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 actual indication at the top is with calm majesty and that seems to sort mm. of imply and it's it's very beautiful because I've actually I I I, I googled a picture and of course it's it's a great place to start where you're actually starting with with an image. Um, yeah, it's a very beautiful piece of music. That, that, now, now as I've seen the image yet again, it confirms the fact that that's where I want to spend the last years of my life <laughs> on the foothills of the Matterhorn. Matterhorn. I should be very pleased, <laughs> and how many wonderful sunrises I shall see. But there we are developing the crossing hands, but most magically of all, it's this sense, sense of um, harmony, which doesn't have a function, where you're using a D major. Oh yes, this is firmly in the key of D major. And then you just glimpse an aspect of heaven to go there. I mean, already my skin is starting to, you know, it's gorgeous, isn't it? I, mm. I hope, well, mm. I don't know what sort of sound you're receiving at that end but it's transforming my emotions. And to be able to do that at a level which is at grade three is just tremendous. And then in the middle, you have wonderful opportunity to balance the hands, bringing out a melody over a fairly straightforward, though descending a group of broken chords on the left hand. But it is just so beautifully structured. And I hope it's going to be uh, a favorite with the, uh, with the students preparing for the exam. Do you know, Peter, I'd love to be your pupil because they would be so inspired by the way that you're, you're 
presenting this you know and that's what's so important isn't it as teachers we have you know we i know from my research that teachers teach because they love music and they love the piano and yet sometimes they get a bit divorced from that love when they're teaching and therefore then and we have to pass on the love and that's exactly what you're doing there you're passing on that love you know which is fabulous that will have that will have to be the best thing that someone has said to me probably all week so thank you very much <laughs> That compliment, but it is just love, isn't it? And you can't help but it do is. that. Mm. Mm. You love the music, and you, you love to convey the message, and you love to share their learning experience. It's not teaching; it's just yeah. a sharing of the learning experience. And you go with them, and you are there. This is so. You know, it's like being a guide on the Matterhorn. Really, it's a guide mm. on the mountain of uh, piano repertoire. Mm. I can't tell you how happy I am to be doing this. It's making me feel a very happy person. <laughs> so you're sharing. Oh, yeah, so it's, all, it's yeah, about sharing right. and it makes... And I know I'm way behind where I should be in the schedule by now. So shall I just go on to... Yeah, just go yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. You're doing fine. I'm going to change now to um, a Latin American style. And in grade four, we have Tango Passionis. A lady composer again. Absolutely. I, 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 <laughs> you just have to go, whoa, at the end of that one. <laughs> I'm putting myself down to the piano stool. Like, you want to be dancing along with this because the, the rhythms are really so infective. Um, <laughs> you know, something, don't we? But um, again, I, I was struck by the, let's say, ingenuity of harmonic language because they're mm. very clever, or Barbara is very clever. Uh, in, in just using basically tonic and dominant chords, harmony, and, and he, through that she creates the section, uh, the style of the tango, and then you get some very unusual, unexpected changes of modulation. So as you go into the middle section, you've got, you're on the dominant of the D minor, and there, but with her she shifts the, the tonality. And again, these are important interpretation things. They are elements of the tango, but presented in their simplest form. Because let's face it, the tango is a very sophisticated, emotional uh, experience. Mm. But here, it is broken down to a level um, at which most people at grade four are going to be able to relate to and to be able to do that. Um, lovely moments of playing in six, deep broken six, as well as block chords. So nice little sort of changes in technique. Um, when I got to the end, I found myself becoming more detached. Doesn't say that on the music, but I thought what a lovely thing to do. And no examiner's going to worry about that. It's, it, this is interpretation. Clearly, <laughs> if, if the composer wants it to be legato or staccato, we, we need to think of following their directions. But perhaps something that's open like that may be open to a little interpretation. I'm not sure Sally approves of that. I can see something in No, it. no, 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 I absolutely <laughs> approve it. I, I... Totally with you on that one, Peter, you know, and it, the thing is to practice it in as many different ways as you can so that on the day you go with the flow and what feels right, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. And the point about that particular passage, which is a little tricky, you would need quite a few uh, practice techniques to mm. become strong with that. 
and, and playing detached is, is one of them. So our uh, adaptability in terms of sort of directing them and guiding them um, with uh, regard to teaching techniques has to be sort of endless, really, I would say. Shall I move on quickly to the last few things? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm just going to shout out quickly. There's, there's right. one comment here um, uh, from Julianne Ingram, who is listening in and saying this is a very good webinar all the way from Australia. So Julianne, yeah. just going to say a very special welcome to you. Um, and I don't know if you caught the very beginning because of course, um, Peter, our presenter, um, was born in Sydney. So let us know exactly where in Australia you are. Um, and so just to say that she's very much enjoying the, um, <clears throat> the webinar. So thank you, yeah. keep, keep going, Peter, this is great. And keep, keep going, Julianne, because it must be very late over there. Thank you for, for watching. Yes, staying up. Now, um, I, I'm going to squash in the last piece, which is in grade five. It's, I've chosen it's quite short, so it'll suit our purposes, because I know we're running out of time very quickly. Um, it's Circus Theme by Postelnik, and uh, it's very jolly indeed. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, I think that got a bit improvisatory in parts. I may have altered the rhythm slightly and I may have added a few alien notes in the left hand. <laughs> in the dance situation, I might have got eight for my communication interpretation for that piece. And that, again, is what matters. I think that's important to note. Little slips actually don't matter ultimately. Mm. If, mm. You, if you have the confidence to carry the character of a piece of music, then those little slips, everybody makes slips sometimes, mm -hmm. but they're not that important. Slips should be dealt with when you are in practice mode, but when you are in performance mode, they should be ignored and you get on with the situation. The chances are that very few people will have noticed them anyway, certainly in a, a normal audience setting. I like this piece because it's, um, it clearly is a lot of fun to play. It's got this wonderful sort of stride left hand. So you've got to be very, very accurate there. And you can imagine um, a lot of time would just be needed using that as an exercise. And probably uh, using the, the sort of um, the time honored way of actually covering the notes, moving very, very quickly and positioning before. Oh, you probably can't see that, can you? But I'm actually moving my hand very quickly and then ensuring that my hand is positioned over the notes before I play the chord so that you allow the hand or the muscular equipment of the hand to measure the distance and you become very very confident with that before you start to put it together. Lovely syncopations there, nice swing rhythms, um, very charming and I think quite sneaky harmonic progressions, lots of sevens, it's just a um, an amalgamation of sevens going from there to there and this is so alluring material. <laughs> Again, this is a wonderful idea for improvisation. You could take out those sevens chords and then before you know where you are you're making your own right hand. You're mm -hmm. discovering new Music from the piece that's being given mm. you. You've actually used it in an organic way. It's inspired other things. It's going to create many, many other pieces if it's used like that. So I've, I've tried to sort of, if you like, incorporate little ideas of using the music as springboards for other aspects of our teaching. And improvisation 
is one of the most wonderful things because it's the ideal route for personal expression and creativity. But it's, it's not all the way to start just by saying, OK, well, here's a motive. What can you do with this? Here's a core progression. It's much easier to start from a known place. And that's why I think using our repertoire as a springboard for the improvisation will actually start to trigger the imagination and it will free people up it will stop them from being too guarded because they're given so they have a given and it's a given they relate to because they may know the piece and so they're able to work from some sense of security because often people are just terrified when it comes to improvisation mm. they're worried about getting it right and of course there is no right or wrong in improvisation. There may be things that are more successful than others, but essentially speaking, there's no such thing as right or wrong. It's about discovering, it's about thinking, oh, that was a funny sound, or I didn't like the way that worked, but that's good because then you develop that. Your experience allows you to become a developer of your improvisation techniques. I'll stop there. <laughs> no, it's great because I'm just reading what uh, Joe Joe's just written down. One of the things you've said, and I'm just copying it because I've written. You've you've come out with some cracking statements, but little slips don't matter hugely as long as you have the confidence to continue with the story. Brilliant, brilliant. That's it. That's what it's all about. It's what it's all about. Yeah. If there was no other message that was conveyed today, that that would be the, the, one of the most important things because it's about making music, it's about personalising it, it's about students really engaging with music. Mm. Not I mean, you'll notice that through our list, we allow a lot of flexibility and choice. So you don't have to go into the exam and play a Baroque piece, a classical piece, a modern piece. Now, that's not to say that we don't want you to teach those stuff. We want teachers to explore every style with their students. But we also want students to go into the examination room playing styles that they feel genuinely connected mm. with. And that's why we offer that flexibility. So we give the teachers the flexibility, as it were, so that they can then work with their students to allow the right choices to be made in the exam room, which then, of course, allows the candidate to demonstrate, to display their strengths. And that mm. really is a lot of Trinity. Mm, yes. Mm. Very much the Trinity philosophy. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think there's just going back to the whole improvisation thing and that, that idea of, you know, just being able to keep going as long as you've got the confidence. The improvisation can give you the confidence to keep going when you make a mistake in your piece. You know, that can be part of the building process for that. No, that's really, really mm. great. I'm just go on, Sharon. Yeah, can we just, I'm just going to ask people to put in, um, I know I typed a comment in earlier. Can you just type in what your number one takeaway has been from this webinar? And in that, <clears throat> whilst you're doing that, Peter, can you just, I mean, you have, I've loved the way you have incorporated um, how improvisation can be used, you know, again, using the pieces as a springboard. Can you um, just, I know we're kind of nearly out of time, but let's just take a few more minutes because I know that people are curious to know about improvisation as in the element of the exam. So can you just take us again another whistle stop tour on, I mean, pick a grade um, and just kind of run through what the expectations are? Okay, well, um, we, we need a whole sort of a session for this, really, don't we? But uh, the, what people need to know is that the Trinity improvisation component divides into three um, categories. We have stylistic improvisation, we have motivic improvisation, and we have harmonic improvisation. Now, those three things are available to all instruments. But may I say that they're not all equally appropriate to all instruments. So I'm going to jump in straight away and say, if you're interested in doing improvisation on the piano, I would make my way to harmonic improvisation, to the harmonic stimulus, because what examiners will be looking for, apart from anything else, are things which are very nicely laid out for you in that stimulus, and which of course will be comfortable to play on the piano. So we're looking for um, a relationship with the stimulus. The examiner has to see that the candidate has recognised what is in the stimulus. Perhaps I just give an example. If I just take initial for a moment. The initial examination, the stimulus is um, it's a four bar long stimulus. It contains four chords and it's just using chord one and chord five in either key of C or G. So you might get something like... And 
a candidate hears that and can see. Uh, so it's a visual and oral thing as well. So we know it's going to be four bars long. We know what the structure is because that's outlined by the chord. So straight away, you're able to graft something onto what you already know because something has been given to you upon which you can work. Uh, examiners are looking for an element of creativity, imagination in the improvisation. And this can come in in different ways. Straight away, you might think, well, let's, let's put the root of the chord in the bass, and we'll try to think of ways of, if you like, elaborating on the triad position, the right hand. So there, I just used the notes of the triad, but I was quite imaginative with my rhythm. And I think this is important, perhaps. So when we're looking at the harmonic uh, improvisation, we could think of taking a chord. You get used to the chord, let me say, parameters for a particular level. So if, you, if you're just looking in C major to begin with, you think of what different ways can you use a C major triad to create rhythmic shapes? Because rhythm will be the thing that creates the interest within the improvisation. So that's the way I would go about it. But of course, if I take a step back, because I've jumped in straight away with the stimulus, I think it's wonderful to have clapping games and just to develop rhythm as a separate sort of idea. People need to be free. People need to be able to express the mm -hmm. idea. So you might want to do, you know, uh, a call and response thing with your student, get used to clapping with them and allowing them to clap as a response or to clap in time with you. So you're straight away freeing up their rhythmic capabilities because then when they come to use notes, they've got something that they can think of. Now, clearly it might be very straightforward to begin with. building up banks of rhythms, we're using the chords and we're actually thinking of ways of making those chord interests through the use of rhythm. So that the examiner will look for the right length, well, that's already predetermined by the length of the stimulus that's given. Um, a relationship with the stimulus, if you're sticking to the chords that you hear and see, you, you'll be fine there, you're sticking to exactly what the stimulus is asking. And then ensuring that you have an element, a spark of creativity, something that's sort of makes that your improvisation so perhaps your rhythm will do that um, and last of all and it's going back to the performance it's important that whatever you do even if it's something let's say that you might think is, is quite basic in content if you keep it going rhythmically it's important to maintain the fluency and say i can play in time here this is my little piece of music so that, that was, um, I, I seem to condense an enormous number of things in a very, very short space of time. Do you think that gives people some idea of what they might be sort of uh, able to do with, say, a harmonic? Absolutely. And I, I know just in response to Jan here, who said, could we have a webinar on improvisation alone, perhaps? And we will certainly, we'll, we'll make a note of that, Jan, because I'm aware, Peter, we're kind of asking you to do something that kind of could take a a full afternoon. <laughs> yeah. really. It is worth me mentioning that um, we do have a, a support page on the website, okay, for piano teachers, and there are some lovely videos which have been presented by Lucinda Mackworth Young, uh, which talk about uh, improvisation very generally, but really in an inspiring way, I have to say. And uh, we're going to be uh, shortly recording. Uh, I think these will be on the right hand, yeah. And so there are going to be uh, more examples on the website and there'll be sort of lessons perhaps with, with the students. So you'll see how Lucinda uh, relates to her students. And then they're going to use um, an example stimulus from the Trinity uh, uh, exam parameters. And she's going to show how that can be incorporated into a lesson situation. So a lot to look out for um, on the Trinity support Wonderful. That sounds like a very, very useful resource. And just to, to confirm, guys, that we um, later on this afternoon, you will be getting the, the replay because I, I know that someone has already, I think it was, I think it's Julianne who's saying that she's looking forward to listening again and making a few more notes the second time around. So the replay will be in your uh, email inboxes later on today. And I know that Trinity are also preparing um, uh, a PDF sheet for us that we will send out as well. And again, uh, the plan is that there will be links on that so that you can go and um, link up with that particular web page that Peter's just been referring to. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to read out a couple of 
people have been sharing their uh, their number one takeaways. Um, let me see if I can just find this. There's one from Caitlin who's saying her number one is taking time to help students think about what the piece is about before getting into the nitty gritty of the notes. Absolutely, Caitlin. I think that is, as Peter was saying, it's so important. I, I, we call it messy piano here. Yeah. So and you know how students always want to play the pieces that they know and that usually we think, oh, it's the pieces their friends are playing. Well, you can play them the piece that you want them to learn before you actually tell them you're going to they're, they're going to learn it. And they'll all of a sudden they'll want to learn it because they've heard it before. So um, just just pre pre frame the piece for them. So much easier. OK, um, I think that's about it really just lots of people saying thank you really and I think it is absolutely been. yes and saying really enjoyed this morning very informative constructive ideas to use many thanks um so again we just want to say a huge huge thank you peter for um giving us of your time and and just your love and passion for music it came through so so vividly so um i think we're all going away feeling very energized i know i certainly am and <clears throat> Lovely, thank you. And I'm just to also looking forward to the next one. <laughs> Indeed. Absolutely. And the other thing just to, to say, we've been talking quite a lot about improvisation this morning. Currently, um, at the Curious Piano Teachers over on our blog. Um, Sally, I'll maybe just get you to type into um, the chat there the um, the URL, which is www.thecuriouspianoteachers.org forward slash blog and um, we've had a, a series, a, a curious uh, improvisation symposium which Trinity College London have been contributing to. So um, do go across and check that out and um, again we look forward to the next webinar. So once again thank you so much for your time for being here and uh, we look forward to seeing you on another Curious Piano Teachers webinar very soon. Have a great day. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.